So we're all going to have to work together so that we can all participate. Um, what we've done is we've opened this door, and that hallway is available, and hopefully you'll be able to hear us um, in the hallway. We're also going to do something that I normally would never do, and I've never done before, is to ask people after they speak to leave the room to allow other people to attend and have the possibility of speaking. Remember, there will be a written record of every word spoken tonight. I have a court reporter here who will take down every word and I'll put it on the library so anyone can get it on the internet. All right? When um, will that be? What? When will that be? When will what be? When, when will it be available? Um, ACE has to transcribe it and then send it to the commission. And so um, they're a private contractor. I don't know when, but usually. My, my court reporter says five days after today. What's the website? www.ferf.gov and I'll announce that later. So for now, if we can have people file through that door into the hallway, um, and I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to start early because people have already signed the speakers list, and um, that's our that's the the, the band date I just I come up with to for this for this problem. So that's the the only thing I can think of. So if people go in the hallways, and then people who do go in the hallways, let me know if you can hear us. Why don't we get rid of some of the chairs, and then we can fit a lot more people standing in the center? Right, the problem is there's probably a code, a fire code, for how many people can be in this room. And, and my, if we still, if we still, It's on the wall over there, how many chairs? It's like 360 or something chairs. Oh, and by the way, I did ask for more chairs, and they don't have any. Uh, chairs available in, in any situation. But I think sitting on the floor is okay. But I think what I see on the on the wall is is we have a capacity of 300 in this room. Let me know if people in the hall are able to hear us. There's more room up front if people want to come up front. Yeah, I, I'm gonna suggest that. that that's a good idea. You want to come up to the front and sit down like these people, that that makes sense to me. And then like I said, after you have the opportunity to speak, if you if you leave and let someone else you know fill the room, that that's the only thing I can think of. And like I said, we did try and rent the auditorium, and I don't know how we didn't get it. Can you say the website again, please? I'm going to say it several times during the speech today. But it's www.frc.gov. G O V. I greatly appreciate your patience and working with us tonight. It's a highly unusual situation. So what we're going to do is, is I've got a bunch of people who've already signed up to speak. And if you don't mind, we're going to start right now. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I, I, I really have to thank you for being here tonight. Um, on behalf of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, we abbreviate that FERC, FERC, or the Commission, and our federal cooperating agency partners, I'd like to welcome you to this public meeting, make comments on the draft environmental impact statement, or DEIS, that the FERC issued on November 7, 2014, for the joint co liquefaction of Pacific Connector Pipeline Projects. We abbreviate that as the project. My name is Paul Friedman, and I'm the FERC Environmental Project Manager. With me here tonight, also from the FERC, is that's Steve Bush, the rather small person there. And he's the assistant project manager. Um, from the BLM, I have Mary Libertor and Mark Mankiewicz. From the U.S. Forest Service, we have Wes Yamamoto. Um, and in the back, who you may have met when you signed up, 
I have the two Johns, John Scott and John Crookston. They work for a company called Tetratech, which is my third party contractor. They helped us produce the EIS. The B11 the Forest Service also has a third party contractor. Um, that company is called uh, North State Resources, and their representative tonight is Mike Hupp and Paul Ungerfer. Let the record show that this meeting began at um, 5.50 p.m. on Thursday, December 11th, here at, uh, I believe this is the old Medford High School in Medford, Oregon. Um, as you can see, this meeting is being recorded by and transcribed by our court reporter on behalf of the firm so that there will be Apple, um, accurate notes of tonight's proceedings. The court reporter is an employee of an independent company called ACE Federal Reporters, Inc. And ACE is an independent contractor. ACE will sell copies of the transcript at various sliding scale prices beginning from same day to five business days after the meeting. If you would like a copy of the transcript prior to it being posted on the FERC website, you must make arrangements directly with ACE. If you'd like to speak tonight, and, and by the way, um, we are contracted till 11 p.m. So we're going to let everyone speak for three minutes each, and we're going to go all the way to 11 o'clock if I need to, to give as many people an opportunity as possible to say something tonight. Remember, if something happened and you didn't get called, you may put your comments in the record, and I'll explain how to do that in a little bit. All right, so someone is telling people again that there's room in the front for people who want to come up to the front and sit down. Um, if you want to speak tonight, there's a sign-up list at the back with the Johns. See, the Johns are waving their hands. Uh, the production of an EIS is a collaborative effort involving a number of federal cooperating agencies, including the BLM Forest Service Corps of Engineers, Department of Energy, EPA, Department of Homeland Security Coast Guards, Department of Interior, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Reclamation, and the U.S. Department of Transportation. The cooperating agencies had an opportunity to review an administrative desk, draft, and some agencies contributed text to the DEIS. For example, the BLM Forest Service and their third-party contractor wrote sections of the DEIS related to their evaluation of proposed amendments to their individual district or national forest land management plans to make provision for the pipeline. In a few minutes, the BLM Forest Service representative will explain the actions of their agencies. I would like to thank the federal cooperating agencies for their participation in the environmental review process. FERC is an independent federal agency that regulates, among other industries, the interstate transportation of natural gas. We were originally known as the Federal Power Commission when we were created by Congress in 1920. At the head of our agency are five commissioners appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by Congress. Steve and I were not selected by the President. We are mere civil servants. We're called staff, and staff makes recommendations to the decision makers who are the five commissioners. The commissioners have not yet made a decision about this project. However, you can read staff's recommendations in section 5.2 of the DEIS. In accordance with the Energy Policy Act of 2005 and the Natural Gas Act, the FERC is the lead federal agency responsible for authorizing onshore LNG or liquefied natural gas terminals and interstate natural gas transmission facilities. We are also the lead agency for compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, which we call NEPA. Our DEIS was prepared to satisfy the Council on Environmental Quality's regulations for implementing the NEPA. The federal cooperating agencies can adopt our EIS for their regulatory needs and to comply with the NEPA. However, each individual agency would present their own conclusions in their respective records of decision. The FERC's record of decision is called the Commission Order, and like I said before, there is no decision made by the FERC yet about this project. The commissioners will make their decision after we produce a final environmental impact statement. On May 21, 2013, 
Jordan Cove Energy Project, LP, which we call Jordan Cove for short, filed an application with the FERC under Section 3 of the NGA in docket number CP13483-000, seeking authority to construct and operate an LNG export terminal at Coos Bay in Coos County, Oregon. Jordan Cove intends to produce about 6 million metric tons per year of LNG from a supply of about 1 billion, dollar, 1 billion cubic feet of natural gas for shipment by third-party vessels to customers around the Pacific Rim. Jordan Cove already has permission from the Department of Energy to export to both free trade agreement and non-free trade agreement nations. The main facilities at the terminal would be a 420 megawatt power plant, a natural gas power processing plant, four liquefaction trains, two LNG storage tanks, a transfer pipeline and loading platform, a marine slip of docks for LNG vessels and tugboats, and an access channel connecting to the existing Coos Bay Navigation Channel. Pacific Connector Gas Pipeline LP, or Pacific Connector, filed its application with the FERC in docket number CP13-492-000 under Section 7 of the NGA on June 6, 2013. Pacific Connector seeks authority to construct and operate a 232-mile-long, 36-inch diameter, underground, welded steel transmission pipeline between the mainland hub and the Jordan Cove Terminal. The pipeline route would, cost, would cross portions of Klamath, Jackson, Douglas, and Coos counties. Near Malin, Pacific Connector would connect, connect to the existing pipeline facilities of Gas Transmission Northwest, or GTN, and Ruby Pipeline, or Ruby, to obtain natural gas produced in Western Canada and the Rocky Mountains. For full disclosure, Ruby is partly owned by one of the partners of Pacific Connector. GTN is owned by a company called TransCanada. The Pacific Connector pipeline would have a design capacity of about 1.07 BCFD with 0.04 BCFD dedicated for delivery to the existing Northwest Pipeline Grants Pass lateral to serve customers in Oregon. Again, for clarification, Northwest is owned by one of the partners of Pacific Connector. It's associated with the Pacific Connector pipeline include a 41,000 horsepower compressor station near Malin, two receipt meter stations for GTN and Ruby within the compressor station track, a Clark's Branch delivery meter station at the interconnection with Northwest, a delivery meter station at Jordan Cove, five tick launchers and receivers, 17 mainline valves, and 11 communication towers. Jordan Cove would receive its natural gas supplies from the Pacific Connector Pipeline. Therefore, although these are two separate applications before the FERC by two separate companies, we see them as connected actions. And we evaluated the environmental impacts of both Jordan Cove and Pacific Connector together in one comprehensive DEIS. The two companies also share some ownership overlap. I want to make it clear that the project is being proposed by two private companies. The FERC is not a proponent of this project. The companies came up with the design for their location of their facilities, and the FERC will analyze the environmental impacts associated with the construction and operation of those facilities. We are advocates for the environmental review process. We are not advocates for the project itself. The commissioners will make their own independent decision about whether this project has benefits would be in the public interest, and that decision will be made in the future. The EIS is not a decision document. During our review of the project, we assembled information from a variety of sources, including the applications and data responses by the companies, public input, information obtained from other federal, state, and local resource agencies, and our own research. Our analysis can be found in the DEIS. We sent copies of our DEIS out to our environmental mailing list, which includes elected officials, federal, state, and local agencies, regional environmental groups and non-governmental organizations, affected landowners, Indian tribes, commenters, other interested parties, local newspapers and libraries, and parties to the proceeding. Paper copies were only sent to those who requested them in response to our notice of intent. 
We have no more paper copies available. All others received a compact disc or CD version. Anyone who received a, co a copy of the DIS will also be sent a copy of the FEIS. You do not have to sign up again. However, if you did not receive a copy of the DIS and you want a copy of the FEIS, please go to the back of the room, see the jobs, and sign up at their table on our environmental mailing list. At that time, you can request a hard copy if you want one. About 72 miles of the pipeline is on federal land, including 40 miles of BLM land, 31 miles of Forest Service land, and less than one mile of reclamation land. At this point, I'd like to introduce Marion Libertor, representing the BLM and the Forest Service, and she will explain what those agencies do with regard to this project. How's that for sound? Can you all hear me? Down the hallway? Okay, good. Um, thank you, Paul. I'm Miriam Liberator. I work for the BLM here at the Medford District, and I'm the BLM's project manager for the Pacific Connector Pipeline Project. BLM enforcers have a role on this project because of the projects crossing over federal lands. And um, we are, just for clarification, we are not involved in the liquefaction plant at Coons Bay, and we're not involved in where the pipeline crosses over private land. But we are involved in where the pipeline crosses over federal lands, and that would be lands managed by the BLM, the Forest Service, and the Bureau of Reclamation. As is proposed in the DEIS, the project would cross, as Paul said, about 70 miles, 71 miles of federal land, 40 for the BLM, 30 for the Forest Service, and less than one for facilities managed by Reclamation. In order to cross those lands, Pacific Connector needs a right-of-way grant to cross over federal land. And that's the same as anybody else that wants to cross federal land, including many of you probably have a driveway over BLM. And so they have applied to BLM for a right-of-way grant at this time. BLM, in order to make a decision, well, BLM is the agency that will make a decision to either deny or issue the grant, and we get that authority from the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920. So BLM will make the decision, and Forest Service and Reclamation will concur with our decision either to grant or deny. Um, at this point, no decision has been made by any of the agencies about the right-of-way grant, and that decision won't be made until after the FEIS has been published and after other conditions that we need to make the decisions have been made. So there's no decision made at this time. The pipeline, if it's constructed, would not conform to the current land management plans that the LN Forest Service used to administer our lands. And in order to be considered for a right-of-way grant, it has to conform. So before we could even consider a grant, our land management plans would need to be amended so that the project can conform. And in this project, in the DEIS, there is a description of proposed land management plan amendments that would allow that to happen. The amendments we would consider are detailed in the draft e, in the draft EIS. For the BLM, it's affecting the Coos Bay District, Roseburg District, and Medford District, and the Klamath Falls Resource Area of the Lakeview District. And for the Forest Service, these are on the Umpqua National Forest, the Rogue River National Forest, and the Wainema National Forest. There are 20 amendments proposed in the DEIS. Four of them are for BLM land management plans, 15 of them are for the Forest Services plans, and then one is a joint amendment for both agencies. These address issues that have to do with our survey and manage guidelines, and for habitat retention for the northern spotted owl and the marble murelet, and for other environmental conditions having to do with soils, visual quality objectives, um, riparian areas, and also a proposal to convert some of our matrix acreage, which is where we have our timber base and other, other uses, um, over to late successional reserves. And that's to make up for the loss, the direct loss of late successional reserve acreage that would be in the pipeline footprint. The decisions that the BLM and Forest Service need to make require us to follow the NEPA process. And so as cooperating agencies, we'll be using FERC's EIS to do that. So our, our proposed activities are being disclosed under FERC's EIS. If you want to comment on them, you can comment on them tonight, like any, 
I'm sure that's why some of you are here. And if you prefer to, you can comment in writing. But Paul will tell you the process for doing so. This is not BLM's or Forest Service's EIS, and so comments would not come to us. So pay attention to the process, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. We're glad you're all here tonight. This is this is process. We honor process, and we want to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. We are now at the beginning of a 90-day period for taking comments on the DEIS. Comments can be filed with the Commission up until February 13, 2015. The FERC keeps the consolidated record for these proceedings, so please do not send your comments to the BLM or the Forest Service. Also, do not send me emails. Apparently, there's an organization out there telling the public false information, and uh, as a result, many people are sending me emails. None of those will be considered by the FERC. Only comments filed in the record are considered by the FERC. I'm going to now tell you how to do that. First, um, you can go to our website at www.ferc.gov and use what we call the e-comment feature on the FERC webpage. Second, you can use the e-filing feature on the FERC webpage. Third, you can write a letter to the Secretary of the Commission at 888 First Street Northeast, Washington, D.C., 20426. Remember to always mark your, remark, your, uh, your comments with the docket number CP13-483-000 for jury pros and CP13-492-000 for Pacific Connector. Everybody got that? Okay, wait a second. I'm going to tell you how you can find this. Besides listening to me. What? I'm going to tell you right now how you can find all of this information on the internet. You can go to www.ferc.gov, hit Documents and Filings, go to the e-library link, and look up our Notice of Availability, which was issued on November 7, 2014, and everything I just said is on that NOA or Notice of Availability. The FERC's address is 888 First Street, Northeast, Washington, D.C., 20426. So not only am I saying it now, you can look it up on the internet. Just look up our notice of availability. Many of you will probably said that or saw it when we issued it. All comments received, whether written or oral, will be given equal weight by the FERC staff and will be addressed in our final EIS. It does not matter if your comments were transmitted on the first day that the DEIS was issued on November 7th or on the last day we take comments on February 13th, 2015. While the purpose of tonight's meeting is to take verbal comments on the DEIS, given the limited time each presenter will have here at this forum, I urge you to send more detailed comments to the FERC, either electronically or in writing. The more specific your comments, the better we can address your concerns. Comments such as, I'm in favor of the project, or I'm against the project, are not particularly helpful. This is not an election, it's not a popularity contest, it's an environmental review, and we want to know the environmental issues that are important to you so that we can address them better in the FEIS. After the comment period ends on February 13, 2015, the FERC staff and our third party contractor, together with the federal cooperative agencies, We'll review all the comments and address them in the FEIS. The, the FERC will issue a revised notice of schedule in the very near future that will present a new date for the issuance of the FEIS and the 90-day period for federal authorizations. No decision about approving or not approving the project is made at this time. The EIS is not a decision document. Only after taking into consideration the findings found in the FEIS will the Commission make their decision looking at uh, both environmental and non-environmental factors, such as market tariffs and rates. If the Commission authorizes the project in an order, only parties to the proceeding, known as interveners, may legally question that decision. The FERC's requirements of filing a motion to intervene can be found under Title 18, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 385.12. While the period for filing a motion to intervene has passed, the Commission will consider requests for late intervention with cause. 
typically affected landowners and those with legitimate environmental concerns who could not be represented by another are considered to have good cause for intervention. However, simply filing comments will not give you intervener status. But you do not need to be an intervener to have your environmental comments considered. An intervener may seek a rehearing on the commission order. If the commission decides to authorize this project, construction may not begin until Jordan Cove and Pacific Connector obtain all other necessary federal permits and approvals. At a minimum, this includes things like biological opinions from Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fisheries Services to, uh, under the Endangered Species Act, a right-of-way grant by the BLM under the Minerals Leasing Act with concurrence from Forest Service and Reclamation. Permits from the Corps of Engineers under Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act and Section 404 between Water Act. Water quality certification under 404 of the Clean Water Act issued by the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Permits under the Clean Air Act also issued by the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Under the termination by the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development that the project would be consistent with the Coastal Zone Management Act. In addition, the Energy Facilities Siting Council of the Oregon Department of Energy must approve the proposed South Dune Power Plant, which is associated with Jordan Cove's terminal. Jordan Cove and Pacific Connector must document that all pre-construction conditions found in the first order have been satisfied before we allow construction to begin. All construction uh, activities would be monitored by FERC staff and the staffs of the federal, manage, the federal land managing agencies. Now is the best part of the meeting, when you, the public, get an opportunity to speak. I remind you that the purpose of this meeting is to hear public comments on our DEIS. In general, I will not be responding to your comments tonight unless you ask an administrative question that I happen to know the answer to. Otherwise, I will just be listening and we will address your comments in the FEIS after we have conducted the appropriate research. Is there, Here, room up front for there actually yeah. is a little bit more room up front, yes. Yes. There's no change. If you go to the front, you have to sit on the floor. Is this just a mistake that you chose a small room? I didn't choose this room. I had a contract for the auditorium. So, whatever happens, if this were present, some would get a voice. It doesn't look good. Because it is what it is. We are outside. We cannot come here. We have no room. Right. I understand that. And so what we've asked is after people speak, to please leave the room and allow people who are outside to come in. We contracted for a larger room. Let the record show that. Let the record show that. Let the record show that it's over, but that's outside. People, after they speak, leave, then there'll be some more room for people who are outside to come in. I agree with that, but there's nothing I can do about it. That might be symbolic. We can't believe. I will consider another meeting back here, maybe. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Another meeting. I would. Awesome. I will consider that. We'd really appreciate it. Yeah. Deadline uh, That's a separate issue, but I will consider having another meeting in Bedford. Thank you. You're welcome. So here are some ground rules for tonight's meeting. After I call your name, please come up to the podium and speak clearly into the microphone. Identify yourself and spell your name for the court reporter. If you represent an organization, state the name of the organization. If you are a landowner along the pipeline route, please provide us with the appropriate milepost for your property or an address or cross street. If you have written testimony for your comments, please give that to my Tetra Tech team at the back of the room and we make certain it gets into the public record. My number one rule, this is very important, please show respect to all speakers whether you agree with them or not. I urge you not to cheer and certainly do not boo. Please. Lastly, because of the large number of speakers we, um, that are here tonight, we are limiting each individual to three minutes. Stephen, show. at two and a half you see a, le a yellow card, and at three there's a red card. At that time I'm going to ask you to stop speaking so someone else can have an opportunity to speak. At this time I'm going to start calling names. Call several so we don't have to wait. For You're exactly what I'll do. That's a great idea. So I'm going to call several and come up to the front of the room and be ready to speak. Gary Woodrick, Neville Herzog, 
Susan Bellis, Elizabeth uh, Halleck, and Louise Sockett. And if I mispronounce your name, you are to correct me, please. If, if I speak and then I have time remaining, can I give it to somebody else? Um, the answer is, is no, because look how many people want to speak tonight. But we, should, we all deserve fair to be minutes. Yes, we all are guaranteed three minutes. My name is Gary Woodring. Yeah, I think I'll get closer. My name is Gary Woodring. G A R Y W O O D R I N G. I am a citizen of Jackson County. I'm not a dollar bill. Okay, this is a message for first. Who do you represent? Could it be, could it be for the people and by the people? I'm going to ask, I'm going to make a statement. The earth is not a commodity. The earth is not a commodity. We all like stories about this statement. Then we continually discount or deny our awareness especially when we are on a powerful commission like FERC. If you look at the events of current, our current political situation, division, in our nation, you will find that overt actions and their consequences are, the, are paramount. There are countless examples of these, I won't give them, but don't add this to that position by uh, this project. Eminent domain by private corporations to condemn and acquire right away for this project <clears throat> finds its essence and genesis in public uh, interest. This project, I submit, is not in the public interest of Jackson County and its prize river, the Rogue River. It is, I, I strongly see it in conflict with the public interest of this county. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Debbie Hunsall. Hi, I'm Deborah Herzog, D-E-B-R-A-H-E-R-Z-O-G. I want to make a great point here. When she leans close to the microphone, look how clear her voice comes yes. out. Well, I'm also a teacher, but that should not take off my minutes. <laughs> I have lived in the Shady Cove Trail area for 44 years. I have taught in the schools there for 34 years. And um, I think I have something, some, some say into what goes on in our area. And this is for the people and by the people. We need to make sure we're standing up. First of all, um, the impacts to the rivers and the streams from this project are huge. And in our area, the fisheries are a huge piece of the, of the um, economy. The fishing on the river brings in people tourists from all areas and brings money into our area. I know there's a lot of people concerned about jobs and that's why they're supporting this project. Some of the people that are concerned about jobs and they think they're gonna have a bunch of jobs with this and that is not true. As you well know, I can't say anything here that you don't already know. I know you know there's not gonna be the kind of jobs that people are expecting and they're not gonna be permanent. But the disasters will be permanent. And after we've had tsunamis that have caused issues with nuclear plants, earthquakes, that can also do the same thing. And we always say, oh, but this one's going to be safe. They always say that until the disaster happens. And then you can't go back. And there are so many important things in our environment here that will be destroyed if there are accidents. Going underneath rivers, first of all, that presents a huge problem. Not only does it affect the fisheries while that construction is taking place, but the, the issue that there can be accidents and what would that do to those rivers and the whole environment around there. 
Climate change is what we need to be addressing here. Also, a new power plant that's going to emit more CO2 into our environment? No, that's not what we need in Oregon or anywhere else in this world. I just hope that you will consider very strongly what this is going to do to the people that are, will be losing part of their land. And I agree with the last gentleman that says that is absolutely not okay for a private company that is not going to benefit very many people when it's finished for them to be able to, t to take land with eminent domain. That is not okay. So I urge you, I urge you, because this is an emergency. This is not just people not wanting to have a pipeline. This is an emergency for our world. And we should be looking at something else other than more fossil fuels and then putting them in areas where we can have real, real disastrous endings for that. No more of this fossil fuel disaster and no more setting us up for huge emergencies such as earthquakes and tsunamis taking out power plants. We need to stop this now. So please listen and protect our rivers and our people and our people, the property owners, and please do not approve this project. Thank you for your comment. Name, please correct me. I'll correct it for the record. My name is Susan Dellis. Uh, this is to the FERC staff, commissioners, and other interested parties. My name is Susan Dellis. I live in the Evans Creek watershed on Sykes Creek Road, uh, Range 4 West Township, 34 South, Section 26 in the Butte Falls BLM resource area. I've spent 30 years commenting on various BLM projects through the NEPA process. I'm extremely concerned and appalled about the Jordan Co. pipeline, which will go through our Butte Falls resource area. Even though I don't personally live that close, I'm about uh, 20, 30 miles away, I believe the character and quality of life, our entire resource area, and that of the Rogue Valley, will be negatively changed by this intrusion. This pipeline will cross 379 bodies of water, including five major rivers. It will inflect, it will affect the community of Trail Creek on the Rogue Valley, which is a major coho spawning area. I'm personally familiar with that area where I have written comments on various BLM projects. This project will destroy that watershed and seriously threaten the coho fishery on the Rogue River. I'm totally opposed to the idea of tunneling under the Rogue River, which is a major body of water for recreation and tourism. Water quality limited streams are already a problem for our southern Oregon fisheries. The potential damage to riparian zones and sediment delivery could have major impacts on the stressed fish population, some of which are in danger, such as the coho. Now accidents, the possibility of accidents due to leaks and possible explosions are made more probable by the lower safety standards approved for our rural areas. The possibility of fires due to explosions caused by leaks are especially of concern in southern Oregon when summer drought conditions are the highest. Fires spread rapidly in this area. The companies chosen to build the pipeline, Williams and PPL, PPNL, have poor state safety records. PPNL is still fighting lawsuits from the city of San Bruno over the destructions of houses and properties caused by a gas leak a number of years ago. Private property. Most private landowners that are impacted by this project are opposed to it. As a landowner, I can empathize with these people. The use of eminent domain for the right-of-way by a foreign company against American landowners should be illegal. The compensation, the compensation received in most cases 
will not be what the land is worth. And the decrease. Thank you for your comments. And of course, you can put additional comments into the record by sending us a letter. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Hallett, E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H, H-A-L-L-E-T-T. -E -T -T. I live in Ashland, 938 Mountain Meadows Circle. I speak on behalf of those who, without a voice, the children unborn or too young to understand, our children and grandchildren, and in my case, great-grandchildren. We must all place a high priority on leaving for future generations a planet that offers to them conditions resembling the hospitality it has offered to us. Unfortunately, the scientific evidence is as clear as science ever gets. The planet is warming. Human actions are largely responsible through emitting gases from fossil fuel extraction and consumption. And, fellow citizens, we are subsidizing these fossil fuel people to the tune of five billion dollars every year. Look it up on the internet. The projections are equally clear. Without our concerted and urgent action, within a few decades, the current trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions will cause the planet to cross a critical tipping point of warming. We do not know exactly when that will be, but the math tells us that we could easily emit enough pollution within the next 14 to 15 years to shoot through the internationally agreed, agreed target limit of 2 degrees centigrade. The math tells us furthermore that to keep global warming below the critical 2 degrees of centigrade target, we must leave most of known fossil fuels reserved in the ground. It is incumbent upon all of us in our individual daily lives and through government policy to minimize the emissions of greenhouse gases however we can. We are here to urge the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to exert the leadership that your responsibilities to the future demand. Please evaluate this proposed pipeline in relation to its potential impact on global warming and the climate, uh, global climate chaos uh, that it would cause. We must have a low carbon future for the sake of our descendants as well as ourselves. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. You're going to see something like this at the podium. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Don't cover it with a piece of paper. That's the microphone for the co-reporter. All right. Thank you. Um, so at, this should be Louise. Okay. And after Louise, we have Diana um, O'Farrell, Mary Ann Shanks, Doug Peterson, Donna Swenson, if all those people would come up to the front, I'd greatly appreciate it. I know that didn't take any time away from you. Louise Shawkat, S-H-A-W-K-A-T, and I am re representing SOCAM, Southern Oregon Climate Action Now. The critical climate role of FERC. FERC's responsibility in analyzing this proposal is clearly stated in the DEIS itself evaluating the need and public benefit of the project. FERC acknowledges the need to evaluate the project in terms of the National Environmental Protection Act. The chairwoman of the President's Council on Environmental Quality has stated quite clearly that in evaluating the environmental impact under NEPA, Agencies know they should consider greenhouse gas emissions. FERC acknowledges also that the evaluation should include cumulative environmental impacts of the project and alternatives. Additionally, FERC acknowledges that evaluating the cumulative environmental impact should include consideration of the impact of this project along with other past, present, 
and reasonably foreseeable future actions regardless of what agency, federal or non-federal, or persons undertakes such actions. We are here to encourage FERC to conduct exactly the kind of analysis that it is authorized to undertake, including the cumulative environmental impact of this and other projects. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. My name is Diana O'Farrell, D-I-A-N-A-O apostrophe F-A-R-R-E-L-L. I'm a citizen of Jackson County, Ashland, Oregon, and also a citizen of our planet. I also am here to represent SOCAN. Despite the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's clear authorization to examine cumulative environmental impacts, of the Jordan Cove Export Terminal City Connector Pipeline, its draft environmental impact statement, the DEIS, has made some confusing statements that must be addressed more clearly. We ask that FERC specifically re-examine its assumption that the project does not demand increased fossil fuel extraction, and further, that FERC take this into consideration when examining the cumulative environmental impacts of the project and evaluation of the project's public benefit. In its draft statement, FERC claims its analysis precludes consideration of out-of-scope issues such as the need to ex export liquid natural gas, horizontal hydraulic drilling through shale formations during exploration for natural gas, which is referred to as fracking, induced production of natural gas, life cycle, cumulative environmental impacts associated with the entire liquid natural gas, gas export process, etc. FERC also claims the life cycle cumulative environmental impacts from exploration, production, and gathering of natural gas, transportation to Pacific Connector Pipeline, and shipment of natural gas overseas from the Jordan Cove Terminal are far beyond the jurisdictional authority of FERC. Despite these claims, its draft statement argues that induced or additional natural gas production is not a reasonably foreseeable indirect effect of the project, and it is not addressed. This is confusing since the Department of Energy states, according to Jordan Cove, this project will support increased production, increased production of natural gas from shale formations. Furthermore, the FERC's analysis states that existing transmission pipelines in the western states are underutilized. So in this case, there is surely no need for the project unless it is expected that further natural gas will be extracted to meet the expectations of Jordan Cove, which of course, the Department of Energy notes, is the case. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission must be made to provide what it is, what was clearly given authorization to do, to examine cumulative environmental impacts of the Jordan Cove Export Terminal Pacific Connector Pipeline and give a thorough impact statement. Clear is the operative word. Without it, no intelligent conversation can be had about the project which should lead to the best decisions about our present and future environmental and economic concerns that will impact us for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Next we have Marianne Schenk, Doug Peterson, Donna Swenson, Tom Collette, and Harry Foster. And again, I ask everyone to come to the front so that they're ready to speak. My name is Mary Ann Shank, S H A N K. I represent SOCAN and I Close live here in town. Close to the mic. How's that? Yes, I uh, know it's great. Uh, uh, Why, I asked. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we even debating this? What yes. Yes. possible right. benefit does it provide to our environment, our forests, our wildlife, or even to ourselves? The answer is simple. None. None whatsoever. Consider the environment. A lot is being said tonight about the pipeline's present and future effect on our environment, and all of it is valid. This project would be devastating to the environment. Consider the impact on wildlife alone. FERC acknowledges that the project, quote, 
would result in impacts to 62 <coughs> species on 386 known sites across the BLM and forest lands in Coos, Douglas, Jackson, and Klamath counties. The project would negatively impact 11 threatened, endangered, or other status <coughs> species. Briefly put, we'd be killing them. The land management plans were carefully designed over years to protect forest health and wildlife. Now we have a project in front of us that does nothing but kill that wildlife. And we are asked to breach the land management plan. Why, I ask. Consider, too, the old growth forest. It cannot be replaced at any cost. Yet 10% of the length of this project passes through late successional reserve forests. It is hard to explain the mystery, the magic of the old growth forest until you have walked through it, like on the Oregon Women's Land Trust land. It's not just another forest. There are no other forests on earth like these forests. Each old growth forest is a compact ecological system <coughs> unto itself, each a unique home to beautiful, rare creatures. Go, spend a day out there. Then tell me that we should allow a hundred yard wide clear cutting across thousands of acres, polluting streams and creeks, killing the fish in those streams desecrating an ancient ecosystem and endangering wildlife that has been placed in our care. And the devastation is not just for today, it is forever. Any oil spill, any, will create environmental havoc that we will never recover from. And there will be oil spills. Have you wondered why California and Washington are not fighting this battle? They're too smart. They won't allow it in. So the oil companies came to Oregon, hoping that we are perhaps dumb enough to let them in. Well, we're not. No. Let's stop it here. <laughs> and after Doug is uh, Donna. Um, and here. By a circuitous route. <laughs> As a part of Southern Oregon Climate Action Now, well, here, I should know better, shouldn't I? All right, my name is Douglas Peterson, D O U G L A S. P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N. As a part of Southern Oregon Climate Action Now's joint statement, this is a cost-benefit analysis and concluding remarks of our five-part joint statement of today. It is clear that it is within FERC's purview and discretion to include the impacts of natural gas fracking and potential greenhouse gas emissions related to this project as part of the analysis of the ecological impacts of the project. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has made a serious error in not including these impacts with this draft statement. <coughs> there can be little doubt that the combined Pacific Connector Pipeline and Jordan Cove Export Terminal projects will directly and indirectly contribute substantially to global greenhouse gas emissions. The main benefactors of this ill-conceived project are not the people of Oregon or indeed the American people at all. Corporate profits and executive salaries of the Canadian corporation Verisan are at stake, not the needs of the people. 
On the bright side, the terminal project promises some short-term construction jobs. Though FERC states in its own writings of 250 jobs, 130 would likely be local. The rest expected to come from out of state. Pipeline construction of about eight months will employ 280 people. Perhaps half of those jobs source locally. When completed, the terminal will provide only 145 permanent jobs, of which 45 are likely to be imported label. This is, leaves a net of 100 additional Oregon jobs. When completed, the pipeline itself will only have a permanent staff of five, five long-term jobs as net benefit to our communities in Oregon. Wow. Jordan Cove will be one of the largest greenhouse gas emitting projects in Oregon, probably soon to be the largest, one of the largest in the world. Members of the committee, attending Oregon agency representatives, fellow citizens, please ask yourself, what will we say to our grandchildren when they ask you what you did to slow the rate of global warming impacts? We urge FERC commissioners to reconsider the true cost of this need you to wrap it up now. and take into consideration its impact on our children and grandchildren. Thank you for your comments. Donna Swanson, D O N N A S, is it Sam W A N S O N? Uh, I have my worker bees bringing out a visual aid because as I was reviewing uh, some of the characteristics of what's going to happen, I was overwhelmed by size. Like 400 rivers. 400 rivers are going to have. Uh, this huge tunnel going underneath, and I'll tell you what, I'll put this. I'm encouraged to respect for a second. Yeah, we're going to give you a couple extra seconds while you're in process. All right. Donna, you're going to have someone hold the, uh, the big white circle? Yeah. Ask someone near you to ask someone to stand up and hold you have to stand up. Okay. All right, yes. This is the size. This is the 36 inches that's really three feet. And that's the size of this pipeline. It's not small. It's going under 400 rivers. And if you'll show the rivers, I put 400 dots on that piece of paper there to show you what 400 rivers look like. It's not, of course, the route, because I couldn't fit them all in that spot. But 400 rivers are going to have this huge pipeline going through them. Okay, so um, I have prepared, oh, I forgot to say, the black dot is the normal pipeline for gas. That's the normal size. This is the size that is being proposed. So, um, this is the proposed 234 mile route of the LNG pipeline from Malin to Coos Bay. And that is what we saw under here. This is right here. Along the route, the pipeline will need to traverse nearly 400 streams and waterways and five large rivers, the road Coquille, Coos, Umpqua, and Klamath. This requires tunneling under the rivers and streams, rerouting of the rivers during construction, and severe disruption to the flow of the river and to the habitat of fish. The actual pipe is 36 inches, three feet, in diameter compared to the average eight to nine inch gas pipeline. The pipeline will carry methane gas, a colorless, odorless gas to be liquefied at the proposed facility at the coast and shipped to foreign countries. This is an unbelievable number of rivers we are giving over to untried methods 
for commercial gain. Why are we being offered as a conduit for the transport of fracked gas from Canada and the U.S. for export? It is not for the public good, nor to help the jobless in Coos Bay and environs. It is for export to Asia and the financial benefit of Harrison, a Canadian firm. This company will be causing the public to pay for the cost of global warming simply from the leakage of the methane that occurs in the transportation and delivery of the gas. In the event of a leaking pipe or disaster, methane gas is released, and because it is an odorless, colorless gas, its location will be difficult to pinpoint. The value for methane is 35 to 85 times carbon dioxide, depending on the number of years assessed. I have a parenthesis there, but it's too complicated, so I'll stick that. <coughs> Only about 2 to 3 percent needs to leak to negate the combustion advantage of methane over oil and coal. Oops. And leak it does from the fracking site through the pipes to the end. Uh, the pipeline route is located in both earthquake and tsunami zones. In the event of a disaster, we will be paying a great price, both physically and financially. The latest projections say that fracking and LPG has a lifespan of approximately 20 years. It will no longer be profitable to continue the practice of fracking with lower prices, less demand, and fracking coming online in other countries. So our environment and natural, natural beauty is being compromised for a very short-term gain, and the gain is not ours. California and Washington protect their coastlines by not allowing this kind Don, of... Don, you got to wrap up that okay. for me, Arch. Okay. Thank comments, and you can put good, good comments in the record. Thank you. Tom Collette. That's me. Tom Collette. C O L L E T T. Um, I'm a fisherman. And I, when you go fishing, like this past summer, you notice that there seems to be a lot of water missing and places that used to be a lot of lake look like a lot of dirt. You know, we're in a water deficit. So I started reading the environmental impact statement. Um, and it, First thing that jumped out to me was water needed. And I'm taking this right off the EIS. 1.7 billion gallons during construction. That's a billion. 1.7 billion. 1.3 million gallons per day during operation of the terminal facilities. And we've already heard this already tonight would affect 400 water bodies, some of them multiple times. And they're going to be using 75,000 gallons per day for dust suppression. 62 million gallons required for the hydrostatic testing. Now, bear in mind, we're in a water deficit, and their estimates now are that it's going to take several years to pick that up if we go back to normal water use. And we don't know if that's going to happen. I had a lot more, but I'm going to stop now and let some other people talk. Thank you for your time. <laughs> we have come today we have Perry Foster, Hannah Saul, uh, Jim Britton, George Logan, Vanessa Nus Nowitzki, Nowitzki <laughs> and John Hunter. If you guys can all come up. That'd be great, and our next speaker should be Harry Foster. Yes, I'm Harry Foster, H-A-R-R-Y-F-O-S-T-E-R. I'm also a fisherman. I'm also a recent transplant to Oregon, Jackson County, Medford. And I come from one of those states that wouldn't allow this to happen. And I saw what happened in San Bruno, and I don't think you ought to allow that to happen here. I don't want, I don't have the kind of detail that's uh, been presented here tonight, and so I don't really have a lot to add to that. I think it's wonderful information that the FERC 
should consider very closely, and I urge you to reject this project. Thank you. Thank you. Project have nothing but great respect for the construction workers who are brought here today um, by the unions. And this is one of the reasons why we work hard every day to push our federal, state, and local officials to speed up the transition to cleaner energy like solar and to greater energy efficiency in all of our buildings and businesses. And in Oregon, each dollar of that kind of investment can create 17 times more jobs than further investment in natural gas, according to the U.S. Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And we hope that moving forward, our union brothers and sisters who are here tonight will join us in pushing hard for those clean energy investments and making sure that many of those jobs, or most of them, are union jobs. And we also strongly support other investments that are needed in this country to shore up our infrastructure, including repairs to existing pipelines and rail lines that are decades old, as proposed by the National AFL-CIO. But the issue here um, tonight is not whether um, folks here tonight, union brothers and sisters, take pride in their work, because we know that they do. But the issue is whether this project is in the public interest or just in the special interest of a few corporations. It will create only a relative handful of permanent jobs, but here's what it will leave in its, in its wake. Increased energy prices, violation of landowner rights and lower property values, a massive terminal vulnerable to tsunamis, a pipeline that adds to our region's wildfire risk, especially since the pipeline company has already had three explosions this last year alone, a brand new power plant that will quickly become the largest source of climate change and carbon pollution in Oregon, increased fracking in the Rockies, which adds to the pollution in those communities and climate damage for all of us. Here in Jackson County, we are already feeling the negative impacts of climate change on our local economy and also our quality of life. A 2008 report called Preparing for Climate Change in the Rogue River Basin of Southern Oregon found that without a rapid transition to cleaner fuels and greater energy efficiency, we face a reduction in snowpack of at least 60% by the time today's newborns enter adulthood, <coughs> along with increasing severity and frequency of wildfires. And we don't have to guess what that means for local businesses and local jobs here in the Rogue Valley. Last year we lost over 100 jobs when Mount Ashland never opened because of lack of snow. Many farmers had to forego crops because of the drought. Tourism was impacted when the Rogue River and the Brit and Shakespeare all were closed for a couple of days um, because of wildfire smoke, which resulted in millions of dollars that was lost from our local economy. This valley has been a magnet for retirement dollars um, that help support our healthcare industry and many other jobs. And so what will happen if smoke and heat and other impacts of climate change result in retirees no longer wanting to come here? FERC's draft environmental impact statement did not even consider the impacts this project will have on climate change. The power, plant, the power plant for the terminal alone, once again, will quickly become the largest source of climate pollution in Oregon. And that doesn't even include the impact of the gas that's shipped overseas. Okay, you need to wrap up now. Okay. This project takes us backwards. Um, it takes us as for the impact of a few, for the benefit, sorry, of a few special interests. Bad for everybody. Um, please deny this point. Thank you for your time. Jim I just got some serious pants comments here. Um, I'm a businessman, and from a business person's viewpoint, um, this project is completely absurd. I mean, it's it's downside for all of Oregon. Oregon gets placed on it, all of the risk, while the profits of this will go elsewhere. Canada, Wall Street types, billionaires, it's not going to help us. Um, environmentally, um, on some different fronts, um, what we have is we have um, tectonic plates at work um, there near Cruz Bay. Uh, the Cascadia sub subduction zone currently is overdue for a massive earthquake. 
by some estimates, perhaps a 9.0 earthquake, which would be devastating. Coos Bay would be completely shattered, as well as perhaps many sections of this pipeline. Um, while this, the plan for this is to cross all these bodies of water, there are going to be huge fish losses as a result of running these giant ex excavators in these rivers to lay this pipe. This is going to kill salmon. Why hell, we're trying to bring salmon back! <laughs> standing ready to start doing the project and uh, ready to have job fairs in the areas that are needed more iron workers and more building trades and uh, thanks for coming out again folks thank you with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. 
Um, this project for us is local work. Anything within six hours is local work, but I want to speak more about you know, safety in the environment because I think that's what you guys really want to hear. So uh, first and foremost, I'm a father, a kayaker, a fly fisherman, and uh, 20 years uh, in the electrical trade. Um, we, do, we recreate on the Rope River, uh, harmless hooks, the whole nine yards. This is, this is where we play. But uh, I want you to know that our union was, was founded on safety. And um, because of that, you're looking at a group of 250 electricians here locally that put monies into our schools, that put monies into co-ops, organic foods, things of that nature. But uh, as far as safety, we're the best. I've worked on two of these pipelines locally in the Modoc County. And I can tell you the first thing that we did in the morning was about an hour's worth of a safety meeting. You have a full-time safety person on that project, walking through the project. You also have um, an inspector get every step of the way, whether you're an electrician or you're on that pipeline and it's being um, x-rayed or welded, to uh, look at every aspect, every aspect of that um, project. So, I guess what, what I want to say is, if the union does this, and it does go through, we're going to treat this property like it's our own backyard. And if soil comes out of the ground, it's going to go back just the way it was. We, we have a lot of pride in this area, and um, this, is, this is how we operate. So, I want to thank you for the time to speak, and uh, for everybody that's here. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your Can I yield my three minutes to somebody else? Okay. I'm going to yield them to Leslie Adams. Good evening. Hi, my name is Leslie Adams, L E S L E Y A D A M S. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. And the first thing I want to say is that the room capacity is unacceptable. Yes. Um, I think it was already stated that that was a mistake, and I want to say the mistake was unacceptable. Uh, yes. Paul, you have been on this project, I think, for seven years, as long as I've been monitoring this project. No, I've been on this project for ten years. Okay, ten years. And I want to say something very Pause clearly. Time, please. Okay, you, it's not on your time I'm speaking. Okay. All right? What I said at the beginning of this meeting is that I'm going to go back to Washington, D.C., and talk to my supervisors, and try and do another meeting back in Bedford very soon. In line with that, um, this project's been going, okay, for about 10 years. I've been monitoring it since about 2007. And I think these multinational energy companies have a filthy amount of money, and they've spent a lot of time with access to our federal officials. And we've only been given 90 days to review a document that's thousands of pages long. And I think it's a very our government should give us a 30-day extension so that we can review this document over Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, New Year. We just happen to get it during the holidays, and it's a lot of information for us to digest. The energy companies have had years to perfect their application. We should be given at least 120 days to review this document, so I'm officially asking for a 30-day extension. Uh, clearly, I have a lot of concerns about the local impacts. I'm not going to get into them right now. I have a lot of concerns about impacts to water quality, streams, and salmon. I want to know if anyone from Oregon DEQ is here. No. Oh, okay. oh someone, thank you. Thank you, Bill Myers from Oregon DEQ is here. Um, Oregon DEQ is going to be, it has a public comment period open right now, and I hope that they will be having a public hearing as well. Um, Addressing the two big gaps in the DEIS, uh, number one is fracking. Clearly this is a connected action. You cannot fill a pipeline for export unless you frack more gas in the Rockies. And so to say it's not something you're going to address in this DEIS is absurd. It's a connected action. It must be analyzed. The second issue is climate change. The DEIS is saying we're just not going to deal with it. And it, it's like me saying that I'm not going to potty train my toddler because I don't want to think about it. But the reality is the shit is coming, and we should do our best to prepare for it. Preparing for it, we can look to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the reports that they're coming out are frightening. They're saying by 2050, we must have 
80% of our emissions reduced by 2050, which might seem like a ways away, but it's actually my son will be my age in 2050. And at that point, we will have needed to reduce our carbon emissions by 80%. And right now, we're talking about building infrastructure to increase our emissions, to be the largest emitter of carbon dioxide in methane in Oregon. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. And I'm extremely disappointed that our government is not analyzing climate change in this document, and they should. Um, I want to close by saying um, a, a quote that I think is often attributed to Martin Luther King, which is, the arc of moral history is long, but it tends to bend towards justice. And I hope to God that that is the case here and that we stop this project because it uh, needs to be stopped. Thank you. And after Stefan is um, Janet Jevons, um, Paula Shaw, John Clark, and Clarence Adams, um, and Bob Barker. So if every one of those people could be up in the front, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, my name is Stefan Gala, S-T-E-F-A-N, Gala, G-A-L-A. Um, I am a Rogue Valley native, born and raised here, grew up in Trail. I am a ISA certified arborist and tree trimmer with over 20 years experience. Um, I know the impacts to the rivers and streams by building these trenches for the pipelines where are going to increase sediment and the clearing of, of the stream side forests are also going to increase the temperatures of these rivers. I know from my own personal experience that I am illegally, I can't even touch blackberries in riparian areas. Um, and these are noxious weeds, let alone clear cutting these streams. Um, this pipeline is going to affect hundreds of fish bearing waterways, over 230 miles of public and private lands, forest and marine habitat and wildlife. It's going to cause a 90 foot clear cut through 75 miles of public lands. 42 of those miles are through old growth forests. The pipeline terminal and the shipping of liquid gas will impact 32 species protected under the Endangered Species Act. And this number is increasing. The Jordan Cove terminal will be the second largest greenhouse gas emitter in Oregon. Um, if this project goes through, fracking in the interior west and Canada would dramatically increase. Fracking and its impacts were not considered in, in the draft environmental impact statement, even though the company stated purpose and need for the project is to increase fracking. The project's DEIS fails to acknowledge the impacts this project would have on climate change, even though recent reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change determined that by 2050, we must reduce our reliance on fossil fuels by 80%. Landowners are also being faced with imminent domain for the benefit of this out-of-state energy, private energy company. This is not what the intended use of intermittent domain was for. FERC failed to consider the impacts of the LNG terminal built on the earthquake subduction and tsunami zone. There is no plan in place for these two 80 million gallon tanks of liquefied natural gas if the power goes out, such as it did in Fukushima. And you can look, at the, the geologists say that we are long overdue for a, for a Fukushima type earthquake of a 9.0 or greater, where we're 75 years overdue. They happen every 400 years, we're 75 years overdue. In 2014 alone, Williams, the pipeline company, had three gas facility pipelines explode, causing serious damage and great risk to human lives. FERC allows lower safety standards for the pipeline in rural areas, which would lead to greater risks for leaks and breaks of explosion because there's less people that live there. So you have less people die. It's ridiculous. Also, exporting of our natural gas will cause our prices to compete on the world market undermining American energy independence while raising our gas prices by up to 25%. Also, the Department of Energy has determined that exporting natural gas could cause up to 1.2 million manufacturing jobs to be lost to overseas factories. 1.2 million manufacturing jobs lost here in the United States. Not a gain of jobs, a 1.2 million job, manufacturing job, lost. I know you want to wrap up now. Thank you. Thank you for coming.
Um, everyone here is concerned about jobs. Uh, I would like to say that um, the trade-off seems to me, from what I see uh, on the, uh, the EIS, that uh, we will indeed lose more jobs than we gain. Um, and I think that uh, the folks who are hoping and praying for good, steady jobs are being shafted by the gas company, and our rural economy depends upon uh, clean air and water for fisheries and agriculture and vineyards, and those will go. And um, it's not fair. It's not fair to anybody, and the gas companies don't care if it's fair. They're going to get you. So. Thank you for your comments. The proposed LNG pipeline would threaten our streams, take over our land rights, dismantle our dreams. The clean energy future we hope to create will take big steps backwards with this gas export bait. And what's the necessity of imminent domain? When all of the profit is for corporate gain, our costs could be doubled for power revenue. While frack gas shipped to Asia enters the atmosphere, <laughs> disrupt 400 streams and rivers, cut down old oak trees, and threaten the crowding and the fishing industries. A power plant to liquefy the natural gas would become the worst polluter that Oregon has. It's time for the carbon to stay in the ground, cause being over for the planet has a terrible sound. So don't build us a pipeline in Oregon State, but add in wave and solar to our energy slate. We need local power, renewable and clean. Investing in fossil fuels will not keep us green. John Clark, uh, C-L-A-R-K-E, uh, milepost 60. Uh, I, I would like to take just a minute and, and make a comment to the crowd because they weren't there last night and I kind of want to take off from where I was last night. Uh, I, brought up, I brought up the point that there was no gas being dropped off off the uh, Pacific Connector pipeline. They say they're dropping it off but they're picking it right up, taking it to Jordan Coast, another pipeline. So that's out of the way. I also submitted a budget or a, a contract between Jordan Cove and the uh, uh, Coos County and in that uh, contract it shows that uh, Coos County has received over two million dollars from uh, the applicant. So I'm going to relate now something that happened to me personally in 2012-13. I entered um, um, an appeal against the planning director for a decision that she made about the airport, the North Bend Airport, and Jordan Cove. I claim that it did not meet the local laws. So let us see what $2 million bought the applicant. We were about into that appeal for three months. And one day I get a letter, and that letter says, the applicant has withdrawn their application, and the planning department has changed their loop. And they took the airport overlay out of the industrial plan. They took out the review process out of the land use plan so that it became an administrative 
decision, and they didn't have to look at the empire. But that's what they got for their two million dollars. That's a pretty good buy. You know? As to date, they haven't refiled because as on the 15th of, of this month, the coup the uh, coups paid, um, paid uh, the uh, board of board of commissioners is going to rule on changes to the comprehensive plan. When you, when you, you local government, so that, and I know that FERC does not enforce laws. I also know that the state agencies don't enforce local laws, and the federal government. And the FAA is going to look at it, and they're going to look at it only the, the height of this thing, uh, and that's 167 feet. And yet the local ordinance says 35 feet. Yet they're going to place a fill in there that is 46 feet. There are high-line towers in front of that airport that are over 150 feet tall. That map that I showed you the other day that showed the pipelines on, on that bridge, those aren't underground, but they're above ground. And that's at the end of the airport. What's in that primary impact area are those liquefaction trains. It isn't just the earthquake. It isn't just the tsunami. It's an accident from the airport. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. Mr. Clark speaks at all of our meetings and has for years. And everything he has to say can be found online because these transcripts of these meetings are put into our e-library system. So if you want to see what he said yesterday, when it comes online, you can read it. Thank you. Uh, now it's Clarence Adams. Clarence Adams, C-L-A-R-E-N-C-E-A-B-A-M-S. I'm an affected landowner, mile post 55.8, and I represent Landowners United. 90% of the landowners believe with everybody in this room that this is a bad deal. What makes it worse is they are underrepresented in this draft PIS. I will point out a few things to back that up. First says believe wins when they say that the DIS found no negative impacts to land values by having a property on, or a pipeline on the property. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> Don't, um, they scored a uh, study in, from the Metro pipeline, which is a 10 inch that comes from the north, and they compared that 10 inch pipeline to the 36 inch pipeline that they're proposing on my property. I don't quite think that's apples and oranges, or quite fair. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, the size of the pipe is never mentioned in any of the other studies, models, and regression stated in the DIS. The pipeline has had an effect on property values. We had a elderly couple in Counts Valley who was a quarter million dollar land deal because the purchaser, or the prospective purchaser, heard there's a pipeline going through their property. I know of two instances where buyers have turned away from looking at homes in the Fox Branch Road area because they heard the pipeline was coming through. If the Pacific Connect gets approved, landowners will get a one-time payment to cover the detrimental effects of the having a pipeline on their backyard, in many cases for the rest of their lives. I would like to see more protection for landowners and their lands in the final EIS, and with the inclusion of an example of contract as part of that EIS, and a little bit more beefed up economic, social economic analysis for landowners the EIS. There's also a couple points I'd like to clear up. Page 5-2 of the EIS, draft EIS states that applicants have received all necessary conditional use permits from affected counties. That's a false statement. They have not received the conditional use permits for the coastal zones and coastal zone management areas for Douglas and Coos County. Those are still under appeal. Page 5-6 states the land to be used by the Klamath Falls compressor station is not irrigated and not used for crops other than hay. Well, I beg to differ. Dry land hay farming is a crop providing high quality hay and has been used in the West for years and will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Bob Clark, after Bob is Stacy Smith, Joan, Joan's starting with a K, uh, Tonya Mora, and Al Shropshire. My name is Bob Barker, I'm the first boss, and the We live 340 feet from the proposed drill entry site underneath the Rogue River, so uh, we treat this uh, project like it's in our backyard as it is. Uh, through my wanderings through the EIS last night, I came across uh, a lot of EIS. Through my wanderings through the um, uh, draft EIS last night, I came across Appendix P, which has about 30 pages of Pacific Connectors proposed site-specific variances for Perks wetland and water body procedures and upland plans. How are we going to know, or when will we know, what happens with these various various variance requests? Is that something you can answer here? We'll address it in the FEIS. What's that? I'll address that question in the FEIS. Okay, so we have to we have to wait until until then. So, for instance, with regard to uh, the Road River crossing, so these temporary extra work areas are required for the Road River uh, horizontal directional drill pipe pullback areas and to access the river for water source, hydrostatic testing, HDD, dust abatement. And so I think the plan is to pull about uh, uh, 8 million gallons of water out of the river for the hydrostatic testing. And uh, this was the first I knew that there was uh, going to be, uh, you know, they're going to be pulling out water for dust, dust control, which would mean the building of an extra, extra road. So the question is how, uh, you know, how we how we uh, interface with these and get the answers with this specific for this specific information. It also talks about uh, although the temporary extra work area is located across uh, intermittent drainages, ground disturbing activities will be minimized through the use of rollers to span these drainages. I have no idea what drainages and what rollers they're they're talking about. Uh, the geoengineers report with regard to the uh, to the crossing with regard to our our side says the uh, um, yeah, the um, entry workspace will likely require clearing and extensive grading improvements prior to construction. You'll have to wait until the, the very end to find out what those are and to negotiate how extensively that is when I'm trying to uh, determine what the, what the damages are to our, to our property. Do we get any indication of, of what those terms mean? Uh, yeah, rhetorical question. I don't know if that will get answered in, in the EIS, but I hope it will. With regard to the Rogue, Rogue River crossing, I have maintained for a long time that if for any reason the HDD fails, if I understand correctly, there are uh, three attempts before a final failure is, is determined. But there is no, uh, there is no agreement or no language in, in this draft EIS about what the alternatives are. There were on the import side. And so I think that uh, you know, if in the event of a failure, uh, we must stop the project until we have permitting for any any alternative. We cannot allow because of the because of the impact to uh, to let this proceed without that being the case. Uh, I'll provide detailed uh, comments, of course, in writing at a later time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And again, I'm just going to reiterate we have after Stacy. It is. Looks like Joe McKay, Tonya Mora, Al Shropshire, John Williams, and then Chris Mathis. Stacy Smith. She decided to submit her comments and write. I'm Joan K A L B E L A G E from Ashland. <laughs> And given the number of people waiting to testify and the number of people who have already made important points about environmental impact, I won't reiterate those. I would just like to raise a smile. Why are you smiling? Can you say it like There you go. I'd like to raise a process point, which is not only is the time for public input very short, disproportionate, as Leslie Adams pointed out, to the input from the corporate world. But the scale of, 
of public input is completely disproportionate to the impact that this will have on our state. There are five hearings, none, in Northern Oregon. And yet this state will be the entire state, not to mention the country, is influenced by global warming. That cannot be contained to Southern Oregon. I talked yesterday to a friend who got back from Roseburg at 3 o'clock in the morning because that's the only avenue available for Portlanders to talk about how they feel about this. 3,000 Portlanders were demonstrating on, on the People's Climate March Day, in addition to the 300,000 in New York. Do you really feel that the avenue for public input, public comment about what we know will be a contributor to global warming, in fact, the greatest in the state is adequate. I believe it's only people in Southern Oregon who are going to be impacted by this. Our forests affect the climate. I live in Ashland. Our city managers are telling us not only is an earthquake overdue, they tell us, prepare. It's not if, it's when. We are really going to put these pipelines through this. Now I'm going to say, I would like to speak for the people who can't be here. I have a friend who is the chief of the Coquille tribe, and in his last year of life, he worked hard to stop the export of coal for the same reason that he would be here now talking about the export of liquefied gas from Coos Bay. That tribe had to look at the possibility of short-term fleeting economic gain in comparison to their native values <coughs> and the permanent impact on future generations. If Ken were here now, he would say, please, reconsider this. I know that you are not the decision makers, but you do have some recommendations to make about the scope of the environmental impact statement, which is not including global warming. You can say, you can make some recommendations about the time and the scale of the opportunity for public input on this. So Julie, I know you want to wrap up now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to reading your boring comments. <laughs> um, so that's Al Shropshire's next. And after Al, John Williams, Chris Mathis, and Allison Longwood. Yes, my name is Al Shropshire, spelled S-H-R-O-P-S-H-I-R-E. And I represent Hummers and Steam Fitters, Local 290. Uh, we have 4,300 plumbers, steam fitters, and pipeliners, mostly uh, that live here in the state of Oregon. And I've, I've heard a lot about permanent jobs. I can tell you that there's very, almost no permanent jobs in construction. Uh, by their very nature, we come, we build a project, and we move on to another one. <laughs> Um, so I've been a I've been in the union for 43 years and have been temporary help for that entire 43 years. <laughs> Our 4,300 members build, service, and maintain large industrial projects and pipelines. It's what we do, and we do it with the most modern materials and most advanced welding and construction techniques known to man. Every one of our members want this project and we, and we want these jobs, but we wouldn't trade the environment for these jobs. Probably some un 
undeserved uh, clapping. <laughs> because we believe that we can have both. We believe that we can have growth and protect the environment. And remember we said we weren't going to boo, okay, or cheer. We were going to treat every speaker with utter respect as you want to treat them. I just kind of have that knack. <laughs> Our members would like to see that the, the landowners are treated fairly and the environment is protected. The economic boost to Southern Oregon, we believe, and the, the tax base that will be increased here is in the public interest. I'd like to thank the members of FERC and the, the panel for being here tonight and allowing everybody to speak. And I'd just like to say that I agree, we're all in this together. And, uh, Let's work together. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, John Lewis. Thank you, John Lewis. Good evening. K O H N W I L L I A M S. I'm speaking on behalf of Local 701. I will discuss this project's impacts on climate change. The draft environmental impact statement failed to include information that demonstrates the project will actually reduce worldwide emissions of greenhouse gases and will benefit our fight against global warming. At chapter 4, page 895, the DEIS claims the LNG facility operations will emit 2.1 million tons a year of greenhouse gases. This figure misleads the reader for the following reason. The Oregon Energy Facility Siting Council will issue an approval to the terminal. FSEC rules will not allow this facility a net increase of 2.1 million tons a year of greenhouse emissions. The DIEIS failed to acknowledge that Oregon's rules require the project to mitigate its greenhouse gas emissions. The project's ultimate net greenhouse gas emissions will be far less than the claimed 2.1 million tons a year. The DEIS also stated the project will cause a 15 million ton a year increase in greenhouse gas emissions from LNG's final use. Again, this misleads readers. This gas will be burned in power plants that would otherwise be burning coal. In other words, the project will allow Asian power plants to leave coal in the ground. This will cause a net decrease in those power plants greenhouse gas emissions when gas is used a lot, utilized instead of coal. The project will export enough gas to displace use of seven coal-fired power plants. If those plants burn coal, they would emit 28 million tons a year of greenhouse gases. Instead, if those power plants use this project's gas as fuel instead of coal, the greenhouse gas emissions from those plants would be only 14 million tons a year for a net benefit for over 10 million tons a year in greenhouse gas emissions reductions. The DEIS did cite studies that the project's export of LNG would replace coal combustion by its Asian customers and would produce substantial reductions in worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. The federal study examined LNG exported from Louisiana to China and determined that that process would reduce worldwide greenhouse gas emissions compared to combustion of either coal or Russian gas. Since Jordan Cove's LNG would travel thousands of miles less to its Asian customers than the project that was studied, Jordan Cove's LNG would provide even greater reductions in worldwide greenhouse gas emissions and estimated in that Department of Ecology study. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> is Chris here? Okay. Then the next speaker is Allison Laughlin. And after Allison, Susan Doherty, Sarah. Westover, Jane, Severo, and Morgan Lindsay. 
Thank you. My name's Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N, Lachlan, L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N, and I represent myself. I've lived 42 years in Ashland, and I hike and boat and fish and um, just love the area. And I stood on the spot where the tunnel is going to go under the Rogue River, and I echo what somebody said. Why are we doing this? And I thought about a hundred foot sway through this beautiful country and I thought, why are we doing this? I heard about eminent domain for two private companies exporting mostly gas exported by a Canadian company. Why are we doing this? I do health and safety inspections for schools and preschools over at the coast. So much time and energy is being spent for the imminent event of an earthquake or a tsunami and yet we're going to put this into that dangerous area. Why are we doing this? We need to reduce carbon emissions. We need to use less. We need to not export our precious resources. Fracking won't last. Someone said 20 years. I wonder if it'll even last that long. I urge you to stop. Excuse me here. All right. Next is Sarah Westover. Hang seats up front. My name is Sarah Westover. It's S A R A H W E S T O V E R. Um, and I'm here as one of many people tonight who work as part of the Southern Oregon Coalition opposing the proposed LNG pipeline. I grew up in Southern Oregon and I continue to live here because I love the sense of community that we have here. And speaking of community, I just want to take a second to recognize all of my uh, peers who are here who have been standing in the back of the room for up to two hours to demonstrate to this commission how much they oppose this project. And I also want to take a second to ask folks who are here in opposition to the project to raise their hands. <laughs> Um, I also, in addition to the wonderful community that we have here, I've chosen to stay in Southern Oregon because I love the access that we have to beautiful forest streams and rivers. I'm also, I will mention, uh, pro-labor and pro-union. In fact, most of my family works in Southern Oregon in the construction field. My mother is a metal fabricator and she taught me how to weld when I was 14 years old. <laughs> As someone who lives in this community, I'm concerned about the pipeline's anticipated impact on the well-being of our environment. But I am just as concerned about how that will impact the existing jobs of Oregonians who currently rely on having healthy streams and waterways to make a living. With the health of Oregon's forests and waterways and our tourist-based economy on the line, I find myself asking, how is this project in any way good for Southern Oregonians. The social and economic impacts of this project seems to be pretty straightforward to me. Private energy companies want to tear a trunch through our state at the expense of the safety and economic viability um, of Oregonians so that they can maximize profits by shipping U.S. resources overseas. And while corporate pro profits will its workers and rate payers who will be paying the price. The Department of Energy has determined that exporting natural gas overseas will cause up to 1.2 million manufacturing jobs to be lost to overseas factories. So not only will we, will we be exporting our gas, but also our jobs. I question the logic of exporting a finite natural resource, which would not only in, undermine US energy independence, but would also raise gas prices for Oregon ratepayers by up to 25%. Oregon families are already struggling to keep up with steady rate increases just to keep their homes warm in these cold winter months. Many Oregonians are already put into a position of having to choose whether they get heat or they eat. The last thing Oregonians need is another barrier to affordable utilities. This product will disrupt the southern Oregon economy offering only a handful of temporary jobs at the expense of ratepayers, our public forests and waterways, and the existing industries that rely on them. 
In my opinion, that doesn't even come close to a fair trade. And that's why I'm asking the FERC today uh, to not only extend the comment period on this project, but also to oppose the project altogether. Thank you. Jade Severin, Morgan Lindsay, Maggie Montgomery, Aaron Moffitt, and Katie Parker. It's Jade's turn to speak. Is Jade here? Jade who? Jade. J-A-D-E. No Jade? The next speaker will be Morgan Lindsay. Is Morgan here? And after Morgan, Maggie Montgomery, Aaron Moffitt, Katie Parker, Rain Crow, please all come to the front. Hello, my name is Morgan Lindsay. You spell that M O R G A N L I N D S A Y. I'm a citizen of Jackson County and I love Southern Oregon. I wasn't lucky enough to be born here, but I found it, and I couldn't be happier than to live in the wild planet Siskiyou. I stand here as an individual, um, and I want to echo sentiments that have been said. Um, that every person in this room deserves a job with dignity. We need more jobs in Oregon, not less. But this pipeline is not the way to get them. I also stand here to represent the 3,000 members of the Planet Siskiyou Wildland Center. That's KS Wild for short. The Planet Siskiyou bioregion of Southern Oregon and Northern California is one of the most diverse in the world. We have over 3,000 plant species Brewer spruce, Port Orford cedar, wild Darlingtonia fens, wild wolves returning to Southern Oregon for the first time in 60 years. This is a special place. It's so special um, that this is not the place for an export pipeline. Um, most importantly, I would like to politely demand um, three requests of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, first, I would like to ask for an extension of the comment period, 90 days over the holidays is not enough time to review 5,000 pages of documents. Please give us more time. Second, I would like to thank um, Miriam Liberator for being here to represent um, the BLM and, um, I'm sorry, Wes is it, for being here to represent the U.S. Forest Service. Um, thank you so much for your public service. Um, KS Wild is here to act as a link between the public and our federal agencies. There are 8 million acres of public lands in Southern Oregon, which belong to all Americans, to every single person in this room. The existing management plans of um, those agencies do not allow this pipeline to be built for good reason. A 95 foot wide clear cut across many streams, um, this is not the way to steward our public lands. Um, so I am here on behalf of KS Wild 3000 members and the thousands of old growth trees, mammals, fish, insects, invertebrates, birds, soil microbes, and the entire tapestry of life that is threatened by this pipeline and export facility. Um, so please take a hard look at all the impacts of this pipeline. I respectfully urge you um, to review those management plans that were developed with many years of public comment and, um, and interaction before amending them to allow private companies to benefit. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Again, there were three demands. Number one, extend the comment period. Number two, FERC, please study the impacts of fracking and climate change on our forests and rivers. And third, Forest Service and BLM, please be a good steward of our public lands um, and take a hard look at those impacts. Thank you very much. Yes, no, no Maggie. All right, next we go to Aaron Moffitt, and then Katie Parker, then Rain Crow, and then Vanessa Sunny. Is Aaron here? Yes. Yes. Aaron Moffitt. Speak a little closer to the mic. My name is Aaron Moffitt. A A R O N M O F F A T T. I'm very happy to see that. The diverse turnout here, this is not a political issue, and I'm happy to see both sides represented here. This is not a jobs issue. It does not create jobs. When an organization like this says, 
jobs are to be created, they're not considering the divert or the negative jobs, the jobs that are lost by a project like this. This does, takes away from tourism. It does not improve the job industry. Jobs can be created with renewable energy, and that's what's ignored here in a project like this. Secondly, this area, the area is bordered by this pipeline, are one of the last, one of the most valuable and necessary to protect areas of our country and this world. Major organizations, the World Wildlife Fund, have recognized this as an extremely important region to protect within our nation and within the entire world. One of just 200 left. And this is one of the most continuous remaining areas of untouched forest bordering these areas. It is essential to protect these and to allow further logging for pipeline creation is unsupportable. I, I urge I urge you to not support this and to follow all the requests of other speakers. Thank you very much.
and their descendants. I also want to say that, thank you for that moment of silence, I also want to say that more people in this room have spoken to the way that the risks are going to be publicized and the profits are going to be privatized, and I have grave concern about that as well. I also want to say that there are a lot of other voices not in the room, the voices of the waters, the voices of the trees, the voices of the lands. And where I come from and the, the way that I participate in these kinds of meetings and uh, discussions, we take into account all of the non-human voices and the consequences to their lives and well-being as well. The last thing I want to say is I agree with the request slash demand for an extension of the public comment period, and I would also like to request that there be public hearings for commentary in Northern Oregon and not just in Southern Oregon. I think you would be surprised to see how many people would turn out in opposition, and I want to ask that for please reject the uh, proposal permit for this project. Thank you. Thank you for your one time for their trouble and made it pretty clear that if they didn't take that they were certain they would get imminent domain and it did not matter. So those are the kinds of people who are in charge of this supposed project and that's what we're dealing with and for me that is egregious for two reasons. One that's so offensive that you would think that that's a reasonable offer to make anybody and two it shows really missing the point because the land is priceless. There isn't an amount of money that anybody at Oregon Women's Lands Trust wants for the land. We want to work together to make sure that the land keeps existing for us because it's not our right to make money off of it and it's not our right to be here. Um, it is a symbiotic relationship and I think that's been heard really loud and clear in this room. I'm really excited to see so many people here. Um, like I said last night, the first couple hours were pretty depressing. Um, and that said, I do also really respect all the union workers and everybody who's come out and spoke in support of wanting jobs and wanting to work on this particular project. I understand the need for wanting a job. I understand there not being um, enough jobs here in Southern Oregon. And I wish that companies that had the amounts of money, um, like Jordan Co. Company, were interested in talking about ways to create jobs that would help continue to sustain the earth and our livelihoods here, as opposed to bidding them against each other, which seems really unfair, because I do think that we should all be on the same team. So, thank you. Next we have with you, Oceana DeLora, Vicki Simpson, John Ward, Stephen Fain, and Forrest English. And if all those people could come to the front of the room, that would be wonderful. Also, I keep seeing some empty seats in the front, so people standing in the back, why don't you take a look and see if you can find yourself a seat. I love to hear people try and say my name. My name is Oceana Demore, and it's spelled O-C-E-A-N-A-H, the apostrophe A-M-O-R-E. 
Um, I'm from Talent, Oregon. I've been a longtime resident here, and I want it clear that I'm here to speak in opposition to this pipeline. Um, as other people have said, there have been so many eloquent speakers addressing most of the issues, so I'm just going to reiterate some things that are important to me. One is I request that you extend the period for hearings um, for this project. And another is that I believe that it is um, FERC's job to evaluate the environmental impacts of the project and that to not um, consider the impacts on climate change and the impacts of fracking um, is something that should be taken into consideration. Um, I think it's pretty clear that there are negative environmental impacts from this project. And I also believe that it is um, FERC's responsibility to look at some alternatives. For example, what if this project didn't take place? Or what if people invested in renewable energy? Um, the, the question of jobs and um, I think it's also really important that it's, you know, there's a few jobs that come from this, but overall there's going to be an exodus of our gas, our resources, and job, American jobs. And um, I think public safety concerns are critical for the whole pipeline and for the um, location in Coos Bay. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Is Vicky here? Next speaker is John Ward. Is John here? Yes. Please come up, John. And after John Ward is uh, Stephen Fain, Forrest English, and Jim Cooksey. Hi, for the record, uh, J-O-H-N, Billy A-R-D, John Ward. We're representing the uh, 150 members of the group fly fishers and wanted to uh, make clear that we're uh, very concerned about aspects of this project. The principal ones are water quality, whether it's in fresh water or to some extent in salt water. The impacts within the uh, Goose Bay itself are certainly a concern. I think they'll be addressed. Uh, but I'm not sure that it's possible to mitigate them. So we're also very concerned about the uh, eminent domain uh, interaction between that and the public uh, need, if any, uh, for displacing people or impacting private ownership of uh, property rights. Um, I wonder if it's possible, Paul, for you to uh, except, uh, uh, I think, a very sincere feeling that, that we're glad you're holding these hearings. Uh, we're uh, glad you're holding multiple ones. But I wonder why it isn't possible for you tonight to kind of clarify in what respects uh, climate change and the impacts of the uh, gas production process itself uh, are excluded from looking at the environmental impacts of this overall project. I'll clarify it in two ways. One, the discussion on climate change is in the DEIS. Please read the DEIS. We discuss it. We disclose all greenhouse gases generated by this project, and we uh, try to assess their environmental impacts. So we do cover that. The other thing is we'll, um, there is a section of the DEIS that discusses why the Commission chooses not to look at fracking, and we will clarify that again in the FEIS. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we're also concerned about the public safety uh, impacts uh, in the uh, immediate Coos Bay terminal area as well as the sedimentation from the uh, disturbances in the uh, forest of Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Stephen Fair. Stephen here? Stephen Fain. <laughs> and after Stephen is Forrest, Jim Cooksley, and Darren McCaffrey. Thank you. Uh, Steve Fain, F is in Frank, A, I, and. Um, 
much has been said here uh, about the role that this proposed pipeline will have on energy and on climate change. I'm gonna. I just want to speak about its role as a barrier to wildlife migration. It's a belief towards A barrier to wildlife migration. With, with climate change, you can have habitat change. Some plants and animals have the ability to move and find habitat that's in green. Uh, a 96-foot swath or clear cut with a three-foot pipeline laying in the middle of it um, might not seem like a barrier to some of us, but it is a significant barrier to migration for other uh, animals and plants. If they can move in response to, to climate change to find uh, some habitat that's suitable, uh, they'll be less capable of doing it now. Habitat fragmentation is a serious problem for wildlife conservation <coughs> everywhere. Certainly here in Oregon, this pipeline will only further fragment <coughs> habitat across the entire state. At the other end of the pipeline, uh, I wanted to say that FERC could, uh, should require that the, the EIS have Criteria, measurable criteria that would evaluate the degree to which the pipeline is acting or as a barrier uh, that the companies that own the pipeline uh, should be uh, paying for biologists, either non-government or government, uh, to measure uh, those qualities that would tell you whether or not these criteria are being met. Uh, if there are uh, impacts, uh, negative impacts, if, if, if wildlife migration is, is uh, impeded, uh, there should be some plan in place uh, to ameliorate that. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping, I have not read the EIS, I'm hoping that it's there. On the other end of the pipeline, there is uh, a matter of all the ship traffic coming from a variety of uh, Pacific Rim locations, different habitats, different wildlife, uh, that will be, some of which can make the transit to uh, the shores here in Oregon. Uh, the Coos watershed uh, could be inundated with uh, exotic, potentially invasive species uh, like those that have been uh, heard of and, and that are laying waste to much of the, of the Great Lakes uh, through uh, various similar uh, introductions. Again, the FERC should require uh, that there be measurable criteria, that those criteria be um, monitored, and that the monitoring is being paid for by the companies involved. Thank you for your comments.
discuss naturally occurring mercury. Uh, again, mercury is a potent neurotoxin. That's not something that you can just put away and mitigate somewhere else. Um, I want to see how birth intends to avoid the discharge of mercury into our public waters. Um, and lastly, uh, I was born and raised here. This is my home. This is where I'm always going to be. And the idea that we want to trash our state and trash our particular region for the benefit of foreign corporations, and we're expected to bear the whole burden for that, I think is entirely unreasonable. I expect FERC to deny this project. Yeah.
I'm one of these guys that do these uh, temporary jobs. I mean, I've been in the trade. I was in the trade for 36 years. I've probably been in there longer. Due to the fact it was a back injury, I was forced to retire. But that's how we raise our families. And I'm sure there's other people out here that don't have to raise their families too. But I want to talk a little bit about about reality too. Reality comes, I mean, how many people here got a cell phone? Come on, raise your hand. Well, you know, we've been the ones that, when the Clean Air Act came in, we're the ones that put all the emissions, the low emissions, on these borders. Believe it or not, we were the ones that built them, too. We were the ones that built these natural gas plants, which is about 10 of them right here in this state, all pushing out over 500 megawatts of time. But the thing is, you look at price-wise, and when it comes down to our, uh, our use of electricity, folks. I mean, right here, what I'm doing right now, what you plug your uh, cell phone into, when you go in and you have a hot shower, you turn your furnace on, believe me, it has to come from somewhere. And I'll tell you what, if anybody's seen the Columbia Gorge lately and seen the wind, the wind uh, turbines up there, that is the most ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. But I'll tell you what, you know, if it could be wind, then we'd be wind. I would go with it. But you know, it's just not sustainable. If the wind don't blow, we don't get no electricity. If the sun don't shine, we don't get no electricity. But I'll tell you what, each and every person in here like to turn their lights on when they go home. Each and every person here are the ones that want to go in a plug in their cell phones to charge them, charge their batteries right here. That's reality, guys, because it does take power one way or the other, whether we like it or not. And that, you know, what it does do is it does make jobs. It makes jobs for these construction workers that have been out of work for a long, long time. Since, that, since 2008, when the market crashed, and you looked, at, uh, you looked at the pension plans and everything of our locals and everything else, we put in so much money because big corporations, they didn't go and they didn't save Lehman Brothers that had $62 billion worth of our funds. So, you know, when it comes to jobs, you know, I, I believe in, I believe in, in fishing. I believe in hunting, because I am one. But I do believe that we gotta, we gotta face reality, too. And I, and I don't know no answer to it. I mean, if I could, if somebody come up with one today. So, I know you want to wrap up then. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. The next two people coming up are Sonia Inch Johansson, Emily Burlett, Dennis Brett, um, and Elvira Skirtle. Okay, please all come to the front. Also, for the people standing in the back, I believe there are some seats in the front you can fill in.
for only uh, 1,000 temporary jobs and less than 100 permanent jobs. This is not in the best interest of the public. Therefore, eminent domain is not appropriate in this case. I might add, who decides what the public interest is? I think we do, not FERC. Lastly, mitigation is not an acceptable course of action for environmental impacts such as increased greenhouse gas emissions, risks, risks associated with the 9.0 earthquake expected from the Cascadia subduction zone in the near future, the effects of fracking in the Rockies, the increased risk of wildfires, the impacts of habitat loss on our sensitive and endangered plant species and animals, or the loss of our last old-growth forests. Since these effects are unavoidable in this project, I ask that you do not allow this pipeline and Jordan Cove terminal projects to go forward. Thank you for your time, and thanks for everyone's great comments tonight. Thank you for your comments. Is Emily here? Yeah. My name is Emily Berlant, E-M-I-L-Y-B-E-R-L-A-N-T. -E I am a lifelong resident of Southern Oregon. I grew up in Grants Pass on the Rogue River. I'm an avid raptor. I work here in the Rogue Valley. Throughout the course of this evening, I have had um, various co-workers, friends, um, and other sorts of associates that are all going to be negatively impacted if this pipeline were to happen. Um, my job would directly be affected. Uh, if this were to cross uh, the waterway of the Rogue River, that would impact my livelihood and my income coming in from that river. And as far as the natural gas bringing us prosperity, as we're learning with food, just because it says natural in it, doesn't make it a good idea. It doesn't mean that it's clean. It doesn't mean that it's going to do good things for us. It's really just not a good idea. Not all things that come from the earth are good for us. Sometimes they're poisonous. And this is definitely one of those. And over the last decade or two, more jobs have been coming in from clean energy industries. We are seeing great job loss from these fossil fuel energy industries. If we keep spooning away at the bottom of the sandcastle, eventually it's going to collapse. And that's practically what we're doing with these elements that are within our earth. We're not going to see them last forever as the sun is going to keep shining until it explodes. But we're going to keep living um, until that happens. And the wind's going to keep blowing, and we are seeing effects of climate change where things are getting windier and places are getting sunnier. So these renewable energies that we can take advantage of are just going to keep being more prosperous as we see the decline of our reserves of fossil fuels. And shipping this gas overseas really is not going to bring any money here into Southern Oregon. We're going to see higher rates, and we are in an area where we need lower rates. People are definitely choosing between eating and heating because they can't pay their power bills. They can't pay their gas bills. They can't pay their rent because we keep seeing rates increase. We have made great strides over the last few years to remove dams on our rivers here. And those are definitely progressive movements to restore our watersheds and to put basically another solid thing in our watersheds is not is not progressive in any way, shape, or form. So I want to thank you guys for being here and everybody who has spoken, all my friends who are here, and definitely request an extension on the comment period and hope that everybody listens to all of this with open ears and open hearts. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Dennis. Is Dennis here? Elvira Sturdkopf, Elvira here, Thad Gala, West Brain, West Kwana, and after West, Keila Thies, Michael Swolenkowski, and Ted Gleitman, and then Jason Kirk, and Alex, but if all of you would come to the front, that'd be great. 
Thank you for having me here in West Brain, W-E-S-B-R-A-I-N. I'm a migrant here, moved to Southern Oregon in 1956. I love this area. We work on issues of economic and social justice, and I want to talk about the economy in Southern Oregon. We have not recovered. This is not important. This is an area where we're hearing a lot about jobs tonight, and we have not rebounded. We do not have the jobs we need in Southern Oregon. There's a lot of people within unions who have different points of view. The House of Labor is divided on this issue. It really is. The short-term jobs are not the way to go, okay? It is not. When we talk about taking our economy here in Southern Oregon, we're talking about an economy that we're exploiting the workforce in a poor area, just like we're exploiting the environment here. This is bad for workers, and this is bad for our environment. It's been mentioned, we, you know, we're on the edge of putting an investment into a new kind of an economy. That's where we need to put, excuse me, that's where we need to put our investment, right there. We can change things. We can have jobs that will protect Southern Oregon, this beautiful environment that we have here, put people back to work, good union jobs, and in fact, that's the kind of boom we need. This is a boondoggle, and it's time that we put a stop to it right now. Thank you very much. Good 
evening. I'm Ted Bleichman, G-L-E-I-C-H-M-A-N, representing Sierra Club, and we'll continue to comment on DEIS deficiencies. In Coos Bay, I detail that we strongly support the good jobs goal, which is the only public good out of this project. But those jobs must be in earthquake and tsunami infrastructure preparedness and in clean renewable energy, efficiency, conservation, and smart grid technology. We have some information available here on that. And I'm now going to mess up my three minutes um, because, carefully timed here, because I feel an obligation uh, in this beautiful crowd of people from all perspectives to dissociate Sierra Club to some degree from the comments about temporary jobs. One of the building trades guys said uh, that they live on temporary jobs, and that's absolutely true. 18 month projects, 24 month projects, those are the ways that people feed their families uh, for most of what is done in construction and development in this country. Now there's a lot of evolution that can occur, but we are uh, in a desperate situation economically. Jobs in Southern Oregon have not rebounded. There's still uh, something like 7% below uh, the 2008 level. And this is a real crisis if you are not in a position to be able to feed your family. We share, obviously, in Sierra Club, all of the concerns that have been expressed around water, forests, climate, but we need to honor the needs of the people. In Roseburg, I noted that FERC is violating its own standards on cumulative impacts, failing to re truly reflect the natural boundaries of the project, including global atmospheric climate disruption impact. In Canyonville, I noted that this failure on cumulative impacts also shows in the Commission's Refusal to recognize that this project will induce fracking its failure to establish comprehensive public procedures to assess the project's financial viability by examining its investors and its financial projections and protections for the public, and its refusal to consider a programmatic EIS on all U.S. LNG financial and energy impacts. These choices, choices by FERC, have short-circuited fair consideration of whether the project is in our best interest. I said I'd speak tonight on why gas is not a climate solution, but I mostly don't need it because that's been beautifully presented. For the record, here are two publications that several in this room made possible, and we have copies in the back. I'll submit them. But the claims of the opposite are not correct and not defensible. Numbers given were distorted and are not valid. We can rebut them. So I now want to conclude by noting that FERC now faces an existential crisis. And in 24 seconds, I hope somebody will give me an extra two minutes who hasn't spoken yet. <laughs> Choices by the Commission to narrow its scope are now obsolete and dangerous. The fossil fuels industry can no longer be treated as a conventional and normal part of the economy, and that is partially a choice by the Commission. 2014 FERC priorities include integration of renewables and smart grid standards. Good. But the crisis is clear, and it is not appropriate to pretend that new fossil fuels infrastructure of any kind is acceptable as business as usual. In virtually every situation where energy evolution is required, renewables, efficiency, and conservation can serve with good union jobs, and the Commission must now recognize jobs that destroy climate stability are not good jobs, and that includes the jobs of the commissioners. Thank you. The next speakers are Jason Kirk, Alex Budd, Elliot Frenzro, and Carol Pell. Jason Cooley. Uh, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, that's quite enough. <laughs> Someone named Jason can speak to me. My name is Jason Kulik, K U L I G. I'm former Navy. I've been a nuclear power plant operator, and I used to work for Merck Pharmaceuticals. All those seemed like great jobs. They were good paying jobs. But, look at all the people that die from pharmaceuticals. We've all heard of Bhopal. We've heard of Fukushima, Three Mile Island. Is that what we want in this area? No. We want to no. We want to go to Bay, Jordan Cove. Right up there with Bo Paul. Nope. No. We can work other places. 
Because a lot of us don't want to live other places. And this is our backyard. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to us.
the public process for 